In this video, we're going to prove the second isomorphism theorem for groups. Analogous uh, theorems can be studied for other algebraic categories like rings and modules, vector spaces, and the like. Uh, but this video will focus on the second isomorphism theorem for groups. So let be, let G be a group. This could be finite, infinite group, doesn't matter. Let H be a subgroup of G, and let N be a normal subgroup of G. Okay? And so then the second isomorphism theorem under those assumptions tells us that if you take the subgroup HN and you mod it out by N, this will be isomorphic to the group H modded out by H intersect N. So before we dive into the proof of this thing, let's make sure that this statement even makes sense. Because if we go about trying to prove nonsense, well, that's going to be a big waste of time. Now note that by assumption, we have that N is a normal subgroup of G. Okay, so since N is a normal subgroup of G, this means that N contains all of the G conjugates of elements of N. So N here is closed under conjugation. In particular, N contains all of the H conjugates of elements from N. So let me elaborate a little bit more about that. So because N is normal in G, we know that for all, uh, for all say, N inside of N and for all G inside of G, whoops, we'll have that G N G inverse is inside of N. That's what I mean by it's closed under conjugation. But G, right, has H as a subset. It's a subgroup, but in particular, it's a subset. So if it's true that for all little G and G, it's closed under conjugation, I could restrict my set to something smaller, right? Um, H will contain fewer elements than G. So if I restrict the set that I'm going to conjugate by, then I'll still be closed under conjugation because we're a normal subgroup. So if G is closed under, uh, excuse me, if N is closed under G conjugates, then N will also be closed under H conjugates. So that's a, that's an important observation to make right here. Also, well, I, I guess the conclusion we make from that is that notice N will be a normal subgroup of H times N. So we proved previously that HN is going to be a subgroup of G. So first of all, HN is a group because H is a subgroup and N is a normal subgroup. Okay? So it even it makes sense to talk about N being a subgroup of that. Now clearly N, which is just equal to E times N, this is going to be a subset of HN because H contains the identity. So the fact that N is inside of HN makes sense. Um, as N is a group inside of another group, it's a subgroup, that's what that means. So the fact to say that N is a subgroup of HN follows from the fact that HN is a group. But the reason we can say it's a normal subgroup is this conversation up here that we're closed under conjugations of H. Um, but in fact, we, you know, I said it's closed under conjugations of H, we could also be like, oh, it's closed under conjugations of HN. If I take some element X, which is inside of HN, uh, then you're going to get these conjugations right there. So that, that's what I'm trying to trying to say here, that as we restrict the group, um, N is still closed under conjugation in that regard. So uh, summarizing what we're just saying there, we, we can say that N is a normal subgroup of HN. The reason this is significant is that this quotient actually makes sense. N is, has to be a normal subgroup of the numerator there, uh, which it is, in fact, the case. So on the left-hand side, we have a legitimate statement. That's a legitimate quotient group. What about the other side? You know, since HN mod N is well-defined, can we say the same thing for H uh, mod out H intersect N? Sure we can. Uh, well, from what we've also seen previously, we've seen that H intersect N clearly, if, if you take a set and intersect another set, that's going to be a subset of, of one of those things. So like H intersect N is a subset of N. Um, but since the intersection of subgroups is itself a subgroup, we get that H intersect N will be a subgroup of N. And then by the same argument as we said before, um, H will be closed under H conjugates because that just comes from closure and multiplication in H. And as N is a normal subgroup, it'll be closed under H conjugates as well. So H intersect N will be closed under H conjugates, so in fact, H intersect N is a normal subgroup of H. We've proven this explicitly previously. So this tells us that in fact, H mod H intersect N is also a well-defined quotient group. So that whole discussion is just to make sense that these two groups are well-defined quotient groups, and it turns out they're the same quotient group up to isomorphism. All right, so how are we gonna prove this? 
So it turns out when one wants to prove that two sub or two groups are isomorphic, there's essentially two strategies to do that. Uh, maybe I, I maybe I dare say there's three strategies. One proves this. Uh, so the first strategy is to actually design an explicit function, a specific isomorphism between the two. It's like I here's the formula for the isomorphism that shows the two groups are isomorphic. Uh, that's 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 a nice strategy. Another one that's a little bit more difficult, and this is the one I'm adding uh, to my list of two that became three, um, is if you do have some type of classification theorem, kind of like the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, there, are, there could be like a certain uh, sufficient collection of invariants that when they agree, they determine the group. And so you could determine that two groups are isomorphic without an explicit isomorphism because, uh, because again, some classification theorem like the fundamental theorem of abelian, finite abelian groups there. That, that, that's an also nice strategy if you have such a classification theorem. Those are sometimes hard to come by. Um, the third strategy, which actually I would think in practice is one of the most common ways to prove two groups is the, are, are, are isomorphic, is use some type of universal mapping property. That is uh, a condition, such as the first isomorphism theorem, that guarantees the existence of an isomorphism. In fact, perhaps like a unique isomorphism, like in the first isomorphism theorem. If we can guarantee the existence of a isomorphism, theorem, isomorphism then the two groups have to be isomorphic. The main difference here is that the, the universal mapping property might not make explicit what that is. The, the isomorphism is sometimes implicit. So what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is you don't want to underestimate how powerful the first isomorphism theorem is. The second isomorphism theorem, we're going to prove using the first isomorphism theorem. And this is a very important strategy for a budding algebraist. How can you prove that two groups are isomorphic using the first isomorphism theorem? So remember what that says. The first isomorphism theorem tells us that a group, if you mod out by the kernel of a homomorphism, will be isomorphic to the image of that isomorphism of that homomorphism. So that's what we're going to do right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to establish a homomorphism from Hn to H mod K, where K here is going to be H intersect N. So really what I'm saying is phi is going to be a map from Hn to H mod out h intersect n, like so. So basically what I'm doing is I, ha I have two factor groups I want to show are isomorphic to each other. So I'm going to take the numerator of one of the factor groups and show that the other factor group is a homomorphic image of that numerator. Then, then we're going to argue that the denominator of the first factor group, its kernel is in fact equal to n. Then it would we could conclude by the first isomorphism theorem what we want. So we're going to try a homomorphic way of proving these two groups are isomorphic. So what's the map hn mod, moving over to h mod k, where again k is h intersect n here? Well, essentially there's only one thing we really can do. Um, if you take a typical element of hn, it'll look like little h times little n. I'm going to map this over to the coset hk, where again k is h intersect n. Okay, so let's first make clear that this is a well-defined map. So suppose we have two different factorizations of the same element of Hn. There could be, uh, there could be such an element, right? So let's imagine we have Hn, which is equal to H prime, N prime, where H and H prime are inside of H and N and N prime are inside of N. Well, if you take this equation here, Hn, uh, this is equal to H prime, N prime. Let's multiply on the left side h prime inverse, h prime inverse here, h prime inverse, in which we see that the h primes will cancel on the right-hand side. Uh, but let's also take n inverse of both sides so that the n's cancel on the left-hand side. This will show that h prime inverse h is equal to n in, uh, in excuse me, n prime n inverse. Well, the, the term on the left this is inside of H because it's a product of two things in H. H is a subgroup. Uh, and the terms on the right, this is going to be something inside of N. N is also a subgroup, a normal subgroup, mind you, but it's, an, it's a subgroup. So product of things in N are going to be in N. So we have something that's in H and in N. So this element, let's call it X just to give it a name. This element actually belongs to H intersect N, a.k.a. it's inside of K. So with that in mind, let's consider the image of 
h prime n prime. Well, by the definition of our map right here, h prime n prime will map to h prime k. But since x belongs to k, right, this right here is just k. Since x belongs to k, you could replace h prime k with h prime xk, right? x represents k just the same way the identity does. And then reassociating this thing, we get h prime x k, right? Uh, essentially, if you have an element inside the group, the group can barf it out without changing the coset whatsoever. Um, so you're going to get h prime x, which look at look at x right here, right? x is equal to h prime inverse h. So if I take h prime times x here, you're going to get h prime inverse uh, times h. Then we're going to see that h and its inverse will cancel out. h prime and its inverse will cancel out, giving us just an h. So we get hk, which is the image of phi of Hn. So this tells us that the map phi is in fact well defined. It doesn't matter on which factorization of the element you use. So now let's prove it's homomorphic. So if we take the product of two typical elements of H, the capital H, capital N, uh, I'm going to use Hn and H prime N prime. So in this situation, we're not assuming that Hn and H prime N prime are equal to each other. They're just two arbitrary elements of our group. Uh, well, because we are in the group, uh, this product is going to equal something in Hn. And we saw earlier how this thing works, that uh, you're going to want to commute this n past this n prime or h prime somehow. Because n is a normal subgroup, this is allowed. Um, h prime will move to the left, but then the n might switch to a different element of n, capital N. Let's call that new element maybe little n double prime, like so. For which then we have something in H, we have something in N, in which case phi will then send it to the coset represented by that element of H, H times H prime, which as this is a coset, uh, it's in fact, it, this is a coset where K is a normal subgroup of H intersect, uh, excuse me, K is a normal subgroup of H. We get that H K or H, H prime K is equal to H K times H prime K. You can factor it inside of the quotient group. Now H K is just the image of phi of hn and h prime k is the image of h prime n prime. So we see in fact that we have a homomorphic map. All right, then the next thing we need to do, now they have a homo homomorphic map is show that it's surjective. This is kind of an obvious statement, right? Because remember phi is supposed to go from hn over to h mod k. So what we're gonna do is notice that you have the element h, like h is a subgroup of hn, right? Because you can just factor everything in little in h just as h times the identity. And so this right here is going to map h h e, which is just h, of course. It'll map down to h k, which if h is an arbitrary element of capital H, then h k will be an arbitrary element of h mod k. So we, we have that. It's going to be surjective. Again, that's, that's a triviality. So then the other thing we had to show, remember, the other thing we wanted to show was that the kernel of this map is equal to n. If we can do that, we can invoke the first isomorphism theorem. So let's consider what elements hn will map to k, which is the identity element of h mod k. Well, if hn maps to k, I mean, it should be mapping to hk, this would imply that h is inside of k, which remember k is h intersect n. Clearly h is inside of h, but this also tells us that h, little h, has to be inside of n, all right? And so this is what then implies for us that the kernel of phi is going to equal n. Those elements, uh, those elements that live inside, and I, I mean, I should also mention, of course, that, uh, so, so if h is inside of k, right? Uh, clearly n is inside of n, like so. Uh, this would imply that hn is going to be inside of n, like we're trying to say here, which is a subgroup of hn. So this is where we get this inference that the kernel is going to be all of n. Uh, again, as we observed right here, if you said n, n will map to the k as well. And so by the first isomorphism theorem, we have this map phi, which goes from hn to h mod k for which the kernel, the kernel of phi is equal to n. So the first isomorphism theorem tells us that hn mod the kernel of phi is gonna be isomorphic to the image of phi, which fill in the details there. We get hn, the kernel we've established was n. 
That's the left-hand side of what the second isomorphism says. And since the map is surjective, since the map is surjective, the image of the homomorphism is the codomain, which we saw earlier was H mod K, which K was just a substitute. This is H mod H intersect N. Like so, thus proving the theorem. Uh, let's look at a quick example of this real quick. Ah, I said quick twice there. Uh, so let's take as a group uh, the symmetric group on four letters, S4. Uh, let's take the Klein 4 group, which is a normal subgroup in there. And so by the Klein 4 group, of course, we mean uh, you have the identity and you have the two two cycles. Uh, let's see. So you have those elements right here. So that's that's what we mean by the Klein 4 group. Uh, and then let's take uh, let's take the subgroup H to be the subgroup generated by 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2. So this is, a, you can really think of like, this is S3. This is the symmetric group on three letters sitting inside of the symmetric group of four letters. All right? So H is a subgroup of G. N is a normal subgroup. So notice those things have been established, right? H is a subgroup of G, because uh, that's really just saying that S3 can be viewed as a subgroup of S4. And we also have the Klein 4 group as a normal subgroup in S4. So we have the assumptions necessary for the second isomorphism theorem. Let's see what it tells us. Uh, let's consider the set HN for a moment. We've learned previously that the set HN, the, the order of this subgroup is going to be the order of H times the order of N divided by the intersection H intersect N right there. Well, H is a subgroup of order 6. It's S3. We get this one right here. N, which is the Klein 4 group, it's order 4. And then what elements are common to both the Klein 4 group and S3? That turns out just to be uh, 1. Uh, that is the identity, it's the only thing common. So you get 6 times 4 times 1, or divided by 1. That gives you a subgroup of order 24, right, because the intersection is trivial. Well, as S4 itself is a group of order 24, 4 factorial, the only subgroup of S4 that has order 24 is S4 itself. So this tells us that Hn is equal to S4. So let's consider then these quotients. If I take S4 mod V4, so the, the, the symmetric group mod out the Klein 4 group. Well, S4 is the same thing as HN. The Klein 4 group is N. By the second isomorphism theorem, this will be isomorphic to H to, uh, mod H intersect N, which H was, this, was the symmetric group S3, and H intersect N was trivial, right? So if you take a group and mod out the trivial subgroup, you're going to get S3. Uh, you'll get the original group back, which is S3. So this tells us, when we put these things together, that the symmetric group on four letters mod out the Klein 4 group is, in fact, isomorphic to S3.